Bridge with Kira is sponsored by the original Done Right Buffalo Wing Sauce. If you're looking for something spicy and different, look no further. The original Done Right Buffalo Wing Sauce is all you'll need. It's good on everything. Homemade goodness from Riverview, New Brunswick. Shipping's available, so check them out. www.dunnrightbuffalowingsauce.com Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Kira Young, and you've reached me on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And as usual, we're simulcasting with Real Liberty Media. Tonight, uh, I have an artist on that I'm going to talk to for the next couple of hours, and he's from central Wyoming. Um, He was born on the Wind River Reservation there, and he, you're going to enjoy. Hello, this is Robert Martinez. Hi, it's Kira Young. Welcome to the bridge. Hi, Kira. How's it going? It's going good. So I was just briefly telling the listeners um, <clears throat> about your background, and you're from central Wyoming, out west from the Wind River Reservation, and um, you do paintings and drawings, and you've been doing it for a while. That's correct. Yeah, I've been... Uh professional artist since about 1997. Oh, right on. And anybody who's listening can go and look at um, some of the paintings and um, Robert Martinez's portfolio on martinezartdesign.com. So if you want to just, if you're by a computer and you want to pull it up and look at his images there um, while we're talking, you can do that. Um, That's right. You can you can do that, or you can uh, check me out on Facebook. Look up uh, Robert Martinez artist, and it should pop up. Yep. So a lot of um, native artists now are putting um, uh, modern images mixed with uh, older images together, and I think it's something special. I really like it. Like I was looking at your paintings um, and also the flag stuff. My uh, my husband is is uh, half Prairie Band Potawatomi and half Northern Cheyenne. And um, oh, okay, me and our, our son were shopping today, and um, my son said, "Oh, look at these pajama bottoms. They're the American flag. Let's get it for Daddy." You know, so that was <laughs> so. The first image <laughs> I see is is the the flag imagery on um, on your paintings. Yeah, that was a, a piece I did a couple of years ago. Um, natives in general, I think, are are really proud of our uh, our veterans and our warrior heritage. And uh, for the listeners out there, I'm not sure if they know, but per capita, natives are the highest serving uh, ethnicity uh, serving in the armed forces today 
in the American Armed Forces. Mm-hmm. And we've served on every single uh, conflict on, on the North American continent. And, and uh, of course, for, for the country abroad. Um, but um, I myself am a, am a huge supporter of veterans and, and veterans' issues. And that was one of the ways I wanted to just uh, say thank you yeah. to our vets and, and all they do for us. Yeah, so when um, one of the ways that the, the honoring of veterans happens in Native communities is at powwows. Um, there's dances and songs specifically for Natives. And one of the things that I like about it is it also includes first responders um, as veterans are considered veterans as well. Because um, mm-hmm. I, I think, um, you know, you put yourself on the line in a, in a similar way as a first responder as you would uh, a soldier. Um, it's a kind of a warrior status that you that you have um, when you do that frontline kind of stuff for your community and right. for your country. Yeah. So if you're if you're native, you have people in your family who are veterans or currently serving. It's just a fact of life in Native America. Yep, that's true. Very, very, very true. Yeah, and I think sometimes non-natives don't really get it. They're like, well, why would you know? Why would you want to? Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we we really hold them in high esteem and high regard when you yeah. put your life on the line for for other people. And I, that's the, probably the biggest issue surrounding uh, the wearing of uh, headdresses around today. People understand why why natives in general are so touchy on that subject. You know, it's because that just for that reason, you had to you had to earn the right to wear one of those. It wasn't just a stylistic mm-hmm. um, yeah. uh, mode of dress. Yeah, it wasn't just a uh, you know I'll get up and wear my headdress today just because it looks cool. Uh huh. Yeah. So natives are like, hey, not not even all natives have the right to wear a headdress. So why would you, for right. just for fashion, you know, that's um, it's just ignorance, really. I think, and um, I think that's why natives work so hard to educate non-natives about native culture, um, just tirelessly. Yep. <laughs> You're expected to growing up. I know too. I know a few artists who are who are a little bit more militant than that. In fact, if they go to a music festival and they see anybody wearing an address, they make it a point to go get the address and bring it home with them. Sure. Kind of like counting coup on the enemy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and um, I mean, a lot of them, though, are, are fake anyway. It's not like they're, you know, walking around Bonnaroo with, with eagle feathers and, and yeah. you know, it's like chicken feathers or something like that. But, um, yeah. It's too bad. <laughs> I think it's a product of American education, you know. Um, and it's that romanticism of the of the American image. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what uh, a lot of those modern, contemporary Native artists like myself are trying to combat is that issue of, you know, we're real people. We had our ups and our downs, and we're still here, and we're not, you know, it's not all about being in the movies or... You know the positive, stoic, uh, romanticized image, or even the the other side of the coin that you know we don't exist at all. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's we're people just like everybody, and and we're still here. Yeah, I I describe it um, the way I see my husband experience things because he has very classic Plains Indian features. So um, when people see him, they recognize him as as native. You know. Um, it's like being a walking archetype. So whatever issues, I mean, all Americans have issues about, especially non-natives, about um, natives because it hasn't been mm-hmm. looked at or dealt with. And so, um, sure. you know, people have this natural, maybe even unconscious yearning to deal with it, but yet <laughs> it ends up being the individual native that has to like represent for all of Native America a lot of times, especially where I live out east. Uh, there, there's very few and far between um, Natives. So right. uh, that's how the the myth of non-existence um, persists. Right. And then by contrast, where I live in the center of a reservation, we have 
um, instead of the romanticized image, we have all the negative images, you know, the alcoholism, the poverty, right. um, that gets played up more than anything else uh, where I live and then, you know, on certain other reservations. And, and we do have those issues that we're dealing with, but then, again, uh, society at large has those issues. We're no, no different than any other American right. uh, eth- ethnic group in, in society. that They deal with those same images, too, or uh, issues, too, so... Yes, but don't have to carry it for the for everyone else. Right, right, you know, exactly. It's, yeah, it's kind of um, like Southern Americans carry racism for the rest of the country. Um, Native Very Americans true. carry uh, alcoholism for the rest of the country. But, um, you know, I just lost my brother-in-law to alcoholism recently. And, um, you know, he's got a little bit of native in him but he's primarily uh white primarily um you know european so um and actually there there was this study that just came out that um that white men in their 40s and 50s are dropping like flies to alcoholism and um you know so the the facts are the facts you know everybody's dealing with it but in different ways in different ways and the, the best way that I've seen Native uh, communities dealing with it is traditional, uh, by using tradition to um, to help people. So when people are struggling with addiction, you know, they go to somebody who, who's who been there before and struggled right. before. So that just makes sense. Yeah, we have we have some of those similar programs actually out here, and, and you see them cropping up on different reservations, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. You know, combat and, that. Yeah, and there, I think when people get more involved in their culture, they sing or dance or, um, you know, learn the language again. You know, freshen up on preserving the languages. Um, it, it gives people a sense of purpose, and uh, helps helps with the idle hands. Sure does. Trouble. Yeah, we have a we have a a big initiative here on our reservation uh, to um, to to broaden our uh, fluent speakers. Currently, we only have about, if I remember correctly, and, and this may be wrong, but it's about fifty six fluent speakers left of the Arapaho traditional Arapaho language. Mm. And we're really trying. Uh, there's various different programs about reservation um, to to uh, bring the language back and, and make it uh, so that there are more fluent speakers you know all of our elders tell us that that our language that language is is the key to um, you know to who we are and and what we what we are as a Arapaho people so they're really making that a, a, a um, goal to to bring back our language, and it's great. I wish I knew more of our of our Apple language. My grandmother was fluent, but unfortunately, never taught her her uh, daughters and sons. And of course, mm. my mother never taught me. So right, yeah, it wasn't encouraged. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't encouraged well, yeah, back I, then. Y- you know, uh, well, my mother is is Northern Arapaho, and then my father is um, Chicano. He's a uh, Mexican and Spanish. He yeah, has both bloodlines, and it was the same in his family. He he wasn't taught how to speak Spanish. Wow! So I, mm-hmm. I would be trilingual, but you know, during the the fifties and the sixties, that was a, that was discouraged. You know, yeah. that you don't we don't we don't want you to speak that. We want you to be American. We don't want you to be, you know, different. Uh, right. To sound different, speak different. Uh, my my husband's grandmother only spoke Potawatomi to him until he was like four. No, until he was a little older, and then after she died, nobody ever spoke Potawatomi to him ever again. So oh, that's... it was like his first language, but yet right. no. So he has a like a different way that he speaks, but it's because it's an English as a second language issue but he still but he doesn't fluently speak his first language if that makes sense it's right um we use it as code more than than a fluent like we 
have certain words that we just use as code when we're out in the world and we know what each other's talking about. So we, a lot right. of natives use, use um, native words as code, but don't really speak it completely and fluently, like or, um, conversationally. Um, it's right. just added yeah. in various words. Yeah, I know some basic phrases and some words in Arapaho, but not that much. And it's the same with uh, Spanish. I, uh, if you talk to me in Spanish, I can kind of figure out what you're telling me, but then I'll answer you back in English. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the same way. I have. Uh, well, I grew up in San Diego, so all you know, most of my neighbors were Mexican, and my cousins are Mexican, and so I'm the same way. I can understand it if people don't talk right. too but I'm I'm too embarrassed to answer you back and <laughs> and That's, uh, my my wife is is Mexican from Mexico and she was naturalized here and became a citizen um before we got married but um she had lived here all of her life but she's fluent uh, Spanish speaker and, and her parents are here too and, and they speak Spanish and we go over to their house and that's all they they speak <laughs> I can understand what they're saying some of the time and sometimes it's too fast. I, I encourage her to, I keep encouraging her to, to uh, teach her daughters how to speak Spanish so I can, I can learn with her, but I haven't been very successful yet. <laughs> yeah. It's one of the things you have to be pretty immersed to as an adult um, or gifted with language. Some people just aren't you know, gifted. Some people have visual gifts like artists, you know, and that's how you express, you express yourself in, in uh, images. I try to. I do. I, I really try. I, uh, I like that, um, that idea of, you know, we're here and, and we're, still, we're still going, we're still strong. I have a series of ledger paintings, ledger drawings, uh, pencil on uh, ledger images from the Arapaho census, and uh, those were were kind of to tell the world, hey, in 1885 there were 823 of us, and of course I overlaid some of our uh, historical figures on this, four of our historical leaders, mm. and uh, and today uh, we're just over 10,000. Yeah, so, so a lot more. That's that's right. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we thrived. You did everything you could to kill us and get rid of us, but we're still here and we're, we're going strong. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I also was reading on your bio that you have some Scots-Irish heritage as well. Um, That's correct. And, and As I do as well. I'm Scots-Irish and Choctaw and um, Basque, I found out on my dad's side um, recently because his dad was adopted and he took mm -hmm. a DNA test and we found out we've got significant Basque heritage, uh, which is interesting because my my father's always really been into flamenco music. And we never mm -hmm. was li always like, where did that come from? But he was like in the Flamenco Society of America and took me to flamenco um, events as as a child. Oh. Yeah, which I loved. Yeah, we and, actually had a significant Basque population in Wyoming there for a while. Um, they're they're great horsemen and uh, cattle and sheep ranchers. Apparently, uh, we had a pretty good population down here. I have an uncle who's got some bass blood, and then in the northern part of northeastern part of Wyoming, there was quite a few of them. Hmm. I think of them as like indigenous Europeans for some reason, um, because their language um, is is unique, um, right? And they have a unique culture and. I was reading about how they were um, they were in this mountainous region and they were kind of cut off from like the rest of Europe for a, a significant period of time, which is what allowed mm -hmm. them to to develop their own language and culture and stuff. Um, it was kind of separate from. Yeah, and uh, they're still fighting for their. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if uh, many of their rights. I'm not sure of, of all the issues, but I know that they they still have conflicts with Spain. Yeah, yeah, and that has to do with language preservation as well. I, you know, language preservation is cultural preservation. It's yep, intimately tied. True. You can't you can't preserve culture without preserving language, and and vice versa. Um, and really, I have this thing 
that I've been talking about for a while on the radio is that um, culture is really all we have. Like the, the whole issue of race is kind of made up. Like there's no real genetic um, variances between so-called people of different races. There, there's just as much variance between them, between people that are supposedly in the same race. And so it's this science, so-called science, that grew up out of um, basically trying to explain the hierarchy that, or justify it, and justify, right. you know, genocide. But it really True. has no, it's like poof, you know, it really doesn't exist. Um, that all we have is, is our culture. And that's all, that's the only differences that there really are. True. You know what I mean? And so when we're focused on on race as being our main differences, uh, especially in Indian country where we play the I'm more Indian than you game and, you know. Um, yeah, we see that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, when we focus on race rather than culture, we lose our culture because we're focused on right. something that's not really real. What do you think of that? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it, it does. Uh, the culture is a, a big part of everything, but um, I think it's a little bit more complex than that because uh, you, culture is a it's just a wide area, but it breaks down into um, maybe clan mm -hmm. culture, uh, family culture, and then individual culture. Yeah, um, you know, we, in in the Indian country, you have you know real traditional people, and then there's kind of some traditional people, and then there's people whose tradition isn't to go to ceremony it's to go to church and then that's mm -hmm. their culture mm -hmm. and, and you know or are, are there's people that are um uh you know i don't know for lack of a better term um more progressive rather than traditional and, and don't go to those ceremonies and stuff and, and that's their culture you know and that's fine for them if that works for them mm -hmm. that's fine um so I think that's a that's a kind of a general term and then once you get down to kind of the specifics uh, it, it makes a little bit more sense. Mm -hmm. For instance, myself, I, I I go to ceremonies every once in a great while, but not not on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Usually, with my art schedule and stuff, I happen to miss most of our big powwows or celebrations. So I'm usually on the road, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so so that's my culture. Now I'm in this this native artist culture. Yeah, and and that's. Yeah. So you're creating a new thing. I mean, it, really, uh, because right. I think because the internet, people, you can get your name out there, um, and then you can also, like, native artists from all over the country, can come together and and right. you know are are a force to reckon with together. Uh, yeah, as everybody knows, and everybody out there listening, you know, everybody's heard of Wyoming, Central Wyoming. It is the middle, and it is the crossroads of Native American art today, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's a that's a big joke. If I would it think it would be Santa media, Fe. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was trying to say. You yeah. know, nobody nobody goes to the Central Wyoming for for Native art. It's not right. the center of, of anything other than Wyoming. Right. Um, if it wasn't for social media and internet, uh, you know, people, you wouldn't be calling me. I wouldn't be talking to you today. Right. People probably wouldn't know about me. I might be getting my stuff out there a little bit locally, but if it wasn't for social media and that platform, you know, nobody would have a chance to see my work, I don't think. Very hard for a uh, for for an artist in general, and you just put native artists on that, and it's it's even even more hard once you once you start putting labels on what kind of artist you are, you tend to limit yourself and mm -hmm. your audience. Right. So who are some of the other native artists that you've got together with and done group shows and things? Oh, wow. Uh, well, um, you can catch me in uh, Santa Fe or in, uh, at the uh, IFAM or uh, the Indian Market. And I have just a ton of, of uh, artists that I think the world of down there and their work. Um, people that I've shown with personally that I, I enjoy, um, you know, I guess if you call it the market, I can name all the big ones, but I don't know very many of them, but maybe group shows that I've done, uh, lately, um, Jennifer White, uh, she's a Rick Raw, I believe, and, 
I, I believe, uh, on another uh, Sioux tribe, but um, she owns a gallery, Post Pilgrim Gallery. If anybody in the Sioux Falls area ever gets out there, I'm in her gallery. She's great. She does contemporary What's the name native of her stuff. Post Pilgrim. Post Pilgrim uh, in, right. in uh, Sioux, Sioux Falls, Falls, South right. Dakota. Right. It's her gallery. She just opened up. I'm in her gallery. She's got a a, a good conglomerate um, of contemporary Native work, not real uh, traditional. Uh, I'm probably the most um, represent uh, representational artist in there. Uh, Don Montalo, very renowned for his uh, ledger contemporary ledger work. He's also in that. I'm really into that contemporary ledger work. I think that's brilliant right. stuff. Uh, post uh, uh, at the Post Program Gallery, there's Paul Highhorse. He does some some very cool graphic work. Jim Wilcox has some some ledger, a little bit more traditional ledger work in there. Um, Melanie Rallis has some some cool paintings in there also. And she does uh, ceramic work, too. Um, another artist I can think of uh, who's, who's great, who does some really cool um, uh, representational work, a little bit more uh, towards the... Um, I don't want to say cartoony, because it's more uh, char- uh, characteristic, uh, is uh, Charles Her Many Horses. That's cool work. Mm. And these are all Northern Plains people mm-hmm. um, that I've shown with personally. Um, about four years back, myself and four other uh, Arapaho artists created the Northern Arapaho Art Society because in the center of Wyoming in our reservation, there was no support for, for Native artists at all. Uh, not, you know, not even an art guild or anything. So we created one. Um, they're all great artists in their own right. Bruce Cook, who's helped me quite a bit. He's a Haida in northern Arapaho. He does some great sculpture, traditional Haida sculpture and, and some good paintings. Uh, Eugene Ridgely, who's quite a bit older than myself and the other three, who's, who's doing uh, painting and drawing. Um, some stuff in the, in the uh, spirit of George Flett and that type of work. And then uh, Ron Howard, who does some very good black and white pencil graphic work. Uh, We were the four that created that. And then we just searched for shows within Wyoming to kind of showcase myself and other artists um, that are northern Arapaho. We just had a show at the Washington Museum in Worland, Wyoming, which went very well. I would love to see a a really really big native art show um, at the Museum of the American Indian in D.C. and New York. I would like to I would like to see them uh, do that. They've, right. they've done a lot, but I would like to see something really big where a lot of art artists get together. I have, uh, yeah, I've, have, I've never been, been over there. I actually have one of my ledger pieces at, at, the, uh, at the Smithsonian over there in uh, D.C. Mm. Which I was, I was very pleased to to have my one of my pieces in their permanent collection. Yeah. Um, I've also been showing with some uh, Montana artists that are that are great. Uh, Josiah Pepion, he does some really cool um, ledger work. Uh, Lewis Still Smoking, he does some some cool stuff. Lauren Monroe um, and uh, Ben Peace. Ben sells his visions piece. Uh, in fact, I'll be doing a show with them uh, beginning of July in Butte, Montana. Butte, Montana. Any listeners out there from Butte, yeah. An- another I believe the title. Part. <laughs> yeah, I believe that their show. The show title is uh, "Native Voices." Good. That's great. I had no idea that your your piece was at the um, Smithsonian, so that. Would it be like in the modern art section? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I've had a couple people go over there, and they said they couldn't find it, so I'm mm-hmm. not real sure where it's at. 
Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I live about a hundred miles from from DC, so I go oh, there wow. from time to time. Um, like to take uh, my son to that museum and that area. Right, they have a they have a market there, and I've been in, you know told to, to check it out, but. I don't know. I from Wyoming to Washington D.C. I'm not sure how long of a drive that would be. I'd have to pack all my stuff over there, and it's it's a full truckload. So yeah, I don't, that I don't would know if like, that's in the cards. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, I drove from California from Oakland. We drove, me and my husband met at a powwow in Oakland in like 1998, 97, 98. Um, and so when we moved back east, we drove. It was like I think it was. 3,500 miles or something like that. Right. It's it's a long distance. <laughs> it's a long way, yeah. It takes a while. A couple of weeks. Um, I used to do a show in uh, Indianapolis at the Idle Jordan Museum, and it's uh, 19 hours from here. So. Yeah, that's a long drive. That's a tough one. Yep. Yep. But the passion of wanting to get your work out there, um, and and actually, people really enjoy meeting the artist that whose work that they're buying. It adds another level to to their um, yeah experience, I guess. Yeah, we always or, usually have good good conversation on that. I I've I've been blessed, I think, because any of the customers or clients that always wanted to buy my work wanted to know the story behind it and more about the culture and I think that's kind of the point you know uh, they don't just, just want the pretty picture they want the idea behind it yeah the, the depth to it um, so what do you think your um, your next step is going to be um, in, in terms of your your art well actually I, I took I just took a next step I, I became a full time artist uh, just within the last month wow that's awesome uh, right uh, until then I had been working uh, in a program for uh, my my tribe for the, for the betterment of tribal youth um, and I just uh, I decided to take the take the leap and become a full-time artist and uh, see how it goes from there. And I think the the next thing is hopefully making it work <laughs> so that I can keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not easy, but um, from what I've seen, you definitely have what it takes to make it work. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, and you're willing to put yourself out there too. I mean, I think it was you that friend requested me, um, so you're willing to put yourself out there and say, "Hey, I want to share my art," and you you share all your your art in groups, and you know that's the way to go. That's how people start seeing your stuff and create more interest. Right. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like just to get to get a wider audience and and get a broader perspective on on uh, what, what you think and different ideas and meet new people and have more good conversations and it's, it's, it's a great it's a great life when it's when, it, when it's going well <laughs> yeah um, but I imagine that it, it I know from experience that when you're in a situation where you can't where you don't know exactly how much is coming in it, it's impossible to budget so it's it's scary you know, in that way. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's definitely scary, uh, especially being a husband and a father, mm -hmm. taking that uncertain leap. And, and uh, you know, I'm not only bargaining with my my own time and money and and stuff, I'm bargaining with theirs, too. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, kind of nerve-wracking. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're going to make it, though. I really do. I have a good feeling. Well, thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, so, I was thinking that um, maybe in the second hour, um, 
you might want to talk a little bit about. Um, you said you were working in a, in a youth program um, about uh, what, what that program was about and um, why you got interested in that as sort of a side thing to, to go sure. along with your art. Um, sure, I can definitely do that. Okay, good. Um, well, we can we can start talking about that now, and then we'll get back into. Oh, the all part. right. Uh, well, uh, let's see. How do I begin? Um, I um, I was fortunate enough to to get a scholarship for art uh, when I graduated high school. I graduated at seventeen, and I got a uh, scholarship to Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design in Denver, Colorado. Um, and I went to what they have at that time, it was called the Accelerated Program. Um, and I graduated in two and a half years with a BA at 19. Wow. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I don't remember sleeping. Yeah, yeah. Through those years, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, came, I came back and I, I, I was living the life of a full-time artist then, too. And then, of course, I saturated my local market. And then, of course, I couldn't sell anything mm-hmm. for quite a bit. So, uh, you know, I had to get a, what everybody terms as a real job. I don't know why I, nobody looks at being an artist as a real job anymore. It used to be for quite a long time. Um, but regardless, I went to went to work and had a, had a number of different positions. Um, and most of those have been in some way related to or directly working for the betterment of Native youth here on our reservation. I uh, worked as a mentor and as a care coordinator for at-risk youth for a program called uh, With Eagle's Wings for a number of years. Uh, And then I worked as a uh, student advocate for the um, school, local school district, uh, Arapaho School, um, ages uh, of grades K through 8. I I did that for almost a decade. And then... Uh, my last position was working for the actual tribe itself. Uh, I was the director of their child support program, and that was uh, um, geared more for families and directly, you know, finding child support for uh, the families uh, of the youth here in the reservation. Mm. What does a um, student advocate do? What's the the goal of the student advocate? <sighs> My main purpose was trying to focus on and change behavior for those students that that kept getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and a lot of times that meant talking with the meant talking with the family a lot, meeting with the family a lot, coming up with different um, individualized plans, talking with the kids a lot, mentoring them, after school programs. I I, I did quite a bit in that position. I had a lot of leeway. It was such a broad uh, um, job description that, mm-hmm. that I could do quite a bit of stuff. Um, For a, quite a while, I came. At, I became the de facto vice principal. Mm. And then I, I still miss them. I still see a lot of my students here locally. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that the, up and have families. The, the programs like that are... are um making a difference in, in the uh, graduation rates in Indian country. Um, they can. They can if there's consistency. Uh, that's the big issue. We we see so many programs coming into reservations that are uh, two years, three years. They come in, they start a good program, have a great idea, and they start to get um, uh, buy-in, and then, then they run out of money, and then nothing happens. Mm-hmm. That's typically the problem in, in, in a lot of reservations uh, that that have stuff like that. So my opinion is that if there's consistency, not only in running the program, but in the leadership of the program, um, they can be really effective. But when tribal politics and different things come into play and then, you know, the director gets fired or quits, then, you know, you have a new director come on with a new set of ideas, wants to run the program a different way, and, you know, things can go downhill. Yeah. So, so what, uh, um, 
tribal politics. Let's get into that a little bit. Um, Oh, are you sure you want to get into that? <laughs> yeah, I think people, I think people really need to understand um, what what uh, people in Indian country are up against, um, because there's uh, both internal and external battles going on. So, mm -hmm. for a person in Indian country, they have to battle within the community, and then they also have to battle externally as well. So it's pretty exhausting. Um, and I don't think people really get it, just how, uh, brutal the politics are. Um, right. I'm, I'm no expert on any, anything like that by, by far, but all I can offer is my opinion and my observation on it. And I, my particular opinion is that many times our tribal leadership is so focused on sovereignty that we forget the bigger well the smaller issue that leads to a bigger issue like um, being able and being qualified to do what you're supposed to be doing right for example if a program is going to hire a, an accountant mm -hmm. to do their money um, and bill payments and making sure everything's on the up and up, then they should hire somebody that's a certified accountant rather than my cousin one who worked for h &R Block for a season maybe that went uh. to college for a couple of years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's that issue. And then that issue becomes later on down the line, oh, well, my cousin that I hired that I thought was going to work out, you know, they skipped a few uh, I's when they were dotting them and they forgot to cross a few T's and oh, now we have a big audit problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then that leads to bad feelings and then, you know, then of course that'll lead to more bad feelings from different families and then all of a sudden you get this whole big community issue that lead, led, led to a big problem which could have been avoided way back when when you, when you hired you should have hired somebody that was qualified I right. see that many times out here where I'm at um, and that's not just in some little position I'm talking uh, tribal um, business council chairman mm -hmm. you know stuff like that um, and you, you read the qualifications for those to, to apply to run for those there there are none really that's where that's where we have to start, I think. Mm -hmm. Either from the top down. That's just my observation on on one particular point of that. Yeah, and and the other thing is that because uh, things like this have been going on for so long, there's the expectation that that's going to happen again with everybody exactly. that comes in. So even someone that may actually be qualified. Um, the expectation is that they were gonna, they're going to fail anyway, and so then they don't get any right. support. So it's right. like this this vicious cycle um, that keeps happening over and over. Um, and I don't know, I don't have the answer to it, um, but I've seen it. I've seen it over and over. I think sometimes yeah. it has to do with um, with like what I call living in lack. So. Mm -hmm. When we experience, um, you know, extreme poverty um, as a child, well, when we grow older, we just we're always focused on making sure that I get mine because I didn't when I needed it when I when it was up right. to some, you know. Um, so that that's just my observation too is that there's. Um, even though the, the, the tradition is that to live is to share, mm -hmm. um, because of that generational trauma of, you know, going from eating, you know, buffalo and berries or, you know, the where life was um, understood and, and you weren't trapped on a reservation with, you know, barely anything to eat. You can't, you know, live the traditional way that you always did and then you have this trauma and people go hungry and there's not enough right. and, um, and so I think it's that 
partly that. Um, cause I've seen very qualified people get in and then they get no support. And then there's that right. whole thing. Well, they think they're better than us because they got the, the education. And, um, so either way it's <laughs> right. Yeah. What, well, you know, there's those big issues of, uh, you know, that we perceive and I think that's the biggest thing is the perception of, mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, outside racism, um, and things like that. But I think really our biggest as, as native people, our biggest and most detrimental, uh, enemy is always ourselves. So it comes from within. It, it is those naysayers and those negative people that are always negative and doesn't seem like they ever have anything positive to say or will do anything positive. I think that's our our biggest hurdle. And it, I think it always, it has been since, since uh, we were, you know, colonized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there was, you know, a traditional way of, of curbing that, um, that, you know, particular pitfall of the human spirit, you know, that's, that's not there anymore. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I've also seen people do it right too. So I'm not, I'm not going to say I haven't like, um, uh, my, my husband's tribe, the Perigrand Potawatomi, they, they brought Harris in to run their casino and they said, you're going to teach us how to do this right. And then you're going to leave. And that's exactly what mm -hmm. they did. And, um, and they had the tribe vote, uh, for the, the per capita money to go into trust for the kids instead of, you know, it going to their right. immediate basic needs, um, that's going into trust for their education. Uh, and then the parents can spend their per cap on the kids' basic needs. Um, so I thought that was done right. Um, right. Yeah. And yeah, right on time when it was time for Harris to leave. I was like, bye. <laughs> Thank you. See you that's later. Great. Yeah. And then the per cap went yeah. up a little after that. There's there, there are there's some very forward looking, you know, future into the future looking tribes that that have that kind of vision, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there's there's some that aren't. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's it's sad to see. And the um, disenrollment thing is really really um, disheartening to see that. Um, I you know I I I can see that, uh, but. And, and I have this, and I'll probably get get emails stuff, <laughs> email after I say this. But um, traditionally, that that was part of our stuff too, you know. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, you had to you had to screw up big time to right. get to get kicked out of your tribe. You had to be you had to do one of the one of the um, you know you, you know you had to commit some kind of atrocity. It had to be mm -hmm. really really bad, yeah, um, to be disenrolled and kicked out of the tribe. I think that shouldn't be a uh, um, definite. Can't ever do that, but I, you know, I, I think it should still be held. Uh, for and I'm gonna, for example, we, we, you know, you have drug dealers and murderers, people who just do some of the most horrible things, you know. Yeah. Um, that if they they did that, uh, you know, traditional times, they would say, you know, hey, mm -hmm. you, you're not you're not a part of it. We don't do that here. Right. If you want to do that? Then go go do that somewhere else. You can. You know, yeah, you're not part of our tribe. You're not one of us. We don't do that. You want to do that? You're not one of us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you can't just disenroll somebody because you know they committed a a low felony or something. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to grade that, but I don't think it should just be a uh, don't ever do it. Yeah. So, like, you know a kid goes and gets his friend a, a bag of weed like he shouldn't be disenrolled for that yeah. but you know he kills people yeah, it, with like know. bad heroin maybe yeah you know yeah you gotta you gotta look at all the factors involved yeah. you know they commit some horrific crime you know I don't see why that can't be uh, a a um, part of the regular punishment but you know, if it's especially if it's a kid, you really got to look at that. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Why are kids thing, right? Yeah. Selling drugs in the first place. Right. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. 
that's not something you want to just enroll for. You want to get them some help and, and figure it out. But you know, if yeah. they're an adult, they know what the hell they're doing, and they commit some horrible crime, then maybe they don't need to be part of the trip. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's the whole thing of, of you know, entire families getting disenrolled, and that seems like more of a political move. Um, right. That kind of thing, at least from what I've read, seems more like a political move. That it usually involves some kind of money. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it's a easy way to up the per cap, you know. It's by right. getting rid of all these people, you know. That's definitely wrong. Yeah, yeah. But then that whole the whole idea of um, blood quantum is really um, screwed up too. Um, it's you know, it was put on natives by the government to track their government policy of breeding Indians out of existence. So, mm -hmm. um, but now tribes use it to, you know, as a, a means to determine membership to the tribe. Um, and different. Right, and it's all, they're all different. They're yeah. All different. Yeah, like I'm Mississippi Choctaw and you have to be half. You have to be half to be enrolled. A lot of tribes, it's like right. a quarter. Or, and then some even more, you know, like a 16th or whatever. It's all different. Yeah, and then there's others like uh, one of the bands of the Cherokee. They don't even have a, they just have a registry. Yeah. You know, as long as you can prove ancestry, then you're part of the tribe. Which, yeah, you all you have to do is prove you had an ancestor on the Dawes rolls, and then you're in. And that's it. Right. Uh, yeah, so, and then there's the whole thing of different tribes, like, don't always recognize each other. So... Mm -hmm. Like like my husband, for instance, he's he's a hundred percent Indian, but only one of his tribes recognizes him. So on his right. card it says he's half Indian, but he's not. <laughs> you know, and so then it says our son is a quarter, but he's, ha you know, he's like five eighths sure, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just I don't know. Yeah. I think it can be kind of, you know, there again we're 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 at this thing like. Um, your family is your family, you know, yep. regardless of what your blood quantum is. Um, right. Right. Like right on my, my bio, and I'm sure you read it, you know, I got Scotch Irish and, and uh, French Canadian and uh, Spanish Mexican and, and on that other. My mother asked me one time, she goes, what do you know that? I said, well, mom, by the, you know, the rules of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, I have to disclose that. Mm-hmm. And um, the well, you know, you know what the elders say: if you have one drop of of Indian blood, you're Indian. Mm -hmm. And then I say, yeah, mom, I I agree with that. But the Indian Arts and Crafts, <laughs> the the Board of Indian Arts and Crafts, uh, and that act, they don't, they don't, <laughs> they don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And yeah, that's what uh, that's what real the traditional elders say. You know, your family. Yeah. Um, your ancestors came from here, then your family, you're, you're part of us. So, well, yeah, you were, you were part of it. You were part of the family, whether you were, you know, um, born of that family or adopted. Right. Um, I, I have a couple of really good friends that, uh, that, that I take as my brothers and well, we always say that they're adopted and, you know, mm -hmm. they're treated like family and, you know, we look, looks at them differently and we just take them like that. Yeah, I, uh, me and my you husband know, are yeah. both adopted into a Lakota family, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually know more Lakota than I do Choctaw. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to learn Choctaw too, but and Potawatomi and <laughs> wow, <laughs> as much as I can. Yeah, it's it's a goal to learn as much native language as I can, <laughs> and throughout my life. Um, but the songs really do. Um, are the best, I think, um, way of learning um, the language because then you have the melody to to remember. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, for it, when I'm, oh, we're about to take a little break. Okay. We'll be back for the second hour in about three to five minutes or so. Alrighty. Okay. Welcome back to the second hour 
of The Bridge with Kira. I'm your host, Kira Young, and we're broadcasting live on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, and we're simulcasting with Real Liberty Media. And for those of you who don't know yet, uh, we do a replay on People's Internet Radio on Tuesday night, and that's at 6 o'clock Eastern Time, um, 6 to 8. So um, during the live broadcast, I'm unable to get into the chat, but um, I'll be in the chat on Tuesday nights um, at People's Internet Radio. And that's where um, they're an Irish station out of Dublin, so um, they have... uh, They usually focus on a lot of Irish issues, but um, they do like to um, connect with their American friends as well. So um, you can catch that replay on Tuesday. And then on Wednesdays, um, we release the YouTube video and it goes on to my blog and, and you can catch it there as well. So welcome back, Robert Martinez. Hi, everybody. We have um, been having a great conversation uh, about a lot of stuff, not just art, but um, a lot of Native issues and um, your other work that you do besides being an artist that you've done with Native youth. Um, it's, uh, it's important. Um, my son has some artistic skills and so I always like to expose him to Native artists so that he knows this is actually something you could do if that's what you want to do for your, you know, your career, your life path. Um, that's, that's great. That's yeah. great. Hey, before we, before we take off, that was great to hear that this is um, broadcast in Ireland. I know. Isn't that um, wild? I had a chance to go to Ireland, um, in 98 and I had a great time. So if any Irish listeners hear this uh, this se- uh, segment um, and know of any museums or something that want to host a Native artist, I'd love to go back over there. Oh, yeah. That was, was a great, great time. I, it was I a, went. Very, a very cool way to uh, to kind of explore the Irish side of my, my ancestry. Yeah. Um, I was there about 10 years before. So my... Actually, my first husband was... He was... Irish heritage, but he grew up in Northern England. So, um, but his mom was from Galway. So we, we spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time there in the late eighties and early nineties. Um, but oh, I imagine cool. it's, it's changed quite a bit. Um, I'm sure since then. Um, yeah, it's, it was, I, we had a great time over there. It was just, you know, coming from, uh, you know, uh, the Western part of the United States where, were uh, you know an old house to us is like a hundred years old. It's wood, you know. And they've got houses over there, hundred, hundred, hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, know, that's what they're still living in. You know, <laughs> they it's, have it, it, yeah. They have really dry cool. stone walls that are like three hundred years yeah. old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it talked about you know kind of a culture shock, but it was great. It was a great culture shock, though. I, like I said, if any listeners know of any museums that can help me get over there to, to put on a show, I would love that. That would be awesome. That would be good. So, um, can they contact you through your website? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they can you contact me through my website. Um, when you were talking about your, your son, uh, I do that with with a lot of emerging artists. I try to give tips um, and uh, help mentor and any, any kind of advice Mm-hmm. Uh, for for uh, for any of them, yeah, that that want to um, to know more about the art game. So you definitely would recommend going to art school uh, for anyone. Well, you can you can be a very good artist and never go to art school, but uh, you you'll end up making uh, you know you you'll find out some mistakes and you'll end up doing some things wrong and then you'll find out later that geez if I just went to art school they would have told me that mm-hmm. you know it, yeah. it shortens that experience gap up I would recommend it if you're really interested in art because there's there's so much out there about art and just technique and history and, and all that, that that you get at art school that you, you really can't get if you're by yourself mm-hmm 
Yeah. Um, when I went, uh, it was just phenomenal. I, you know, when you can see your progress, that's that's how you know you're really you're really learning stuff, and you can actually look at your your own work and see, wow, I'm getting better. That's when you know that you're actually something, and it's making a an impact. Mm-hmm. And you meet great people. If you go to art school, um, anybody up there that's ever been to art school knows that uh, it's the craziest people out of every segment, clique, and race, and creed, and religion. They all go to art school. Yeah, they want to be artists. <laughs> so it's 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 a nut house, man. But it's it's a great it's a great it's, it is a great experience. I uh, I got my degree, my bachelor's in philosophy. Uh, but I worked at um, as an artist model all through my mm. late teens and into my twenties. Um, so I hung out with artists because I was uh, I was always um, you know posing for paintings and sculptures and things like that. Um, so I, I have a um, a fondness and a familiarity with art school, um, although I did not attend. But my twin brother did. My twin brother's a visual. Yeah artist so he's a printmaker by oh, nice. by trade um, cool. and then he taught himself code how to write code so he makes a lot of money <laughs> right. uh, doing that and then um, his wife is also an artist so um, got a lot of artists in the family my grandfather is an artist my auntie um, lots of artists uh, so awesome yeah so you were you were a model were you a clothes model or you oh yeah no I did um uh, nude modeling. I got a surprising amount of um, portrait work. Um, like I got half and half, which was like, oh wow, yeah, which was amazing. Because um, I, I pretty much figured I'd have to take my clothes off every time, but I didn't. And I had this little dog, um, Mutley was his name. Uh-huh. He was a Jack Russell Terrier, and he would pose with me. He um, right. would, and he would stay still until I told him he could move, and he would stay in the same exact. Oh pose. wow, yeah. Yeah, so um, that was fun. Plus, it was cash, you know. Um, yeah, cash. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that yeah, was great. It's actually pretty, pretty decent. I remember when I was in school, and I they told me how much the, the models were making. I thought, "Jeez, get probably now I'd have to take my clothes off." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the kicker right there. Um, but yeah, and because uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a stick figure. Um, I got a lot of work, you know, people wanted to paint something a little different um, than just something really, really skinny, um, <laughs> which right, and it's usually right. just the skinny, the real skinny, skinny girls that have the confidence, you know, to be a model, an artist model. And that's just because culturally that's, you know, uh, the only thing that's acceptable. Uh, but we, we always had a really good... Um, collection of, of different body types and you know male and female and stuff. I you know, remember my my friends when I would come home back up here to the reservation they they thought that was cool so you 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 see naked naked uh, women right I was like yeah yeah I paint I draw or paint naked people from eight to three every day man I'm like so you see some good ones I'm like well yeah but you know about after the first five minutes it's work <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. It's just, uh, you're, you know, what you're doing. Yeah. It's work. Yeah. Yeah. But I, uh, I kind of made it a meditation, you know, um, having to sit still for long periods of time. Uh, I, I've always wondered that. Yeah. And sometimes I, I would do these little sort of experiments. I would focus on a certain, you know, image, um, or feeling or something like that. And then I would see if, if any of the artists picked up on it, who were, who were painting or, and it, and they did it a time from time to time. It, it, um, somebody would pick up on whatever image and they would have that in the background or whatever, just randomly. Like I would think about a hummingbird for the whole, for the whole pose. And then you, one of the artists would draw a hummingbird in it, even though the hummingbird wasn't in the in the pose they'd be like i just i just felt like you know putting this bird here too interesting and, uh, yeah yeah so uh, yeah 
I used to love to work for models. Unfortunately, I don't get very many up here. <laughs> yeah, I bet not. I end up having to work from from photographs most most often. Mm. Which is totally different. You're not getting all the shades and the light and you know the different. Um, but I mean, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the nuances get get a little lost, or I have to create them, which mm -hmm. kind of works sometimes. So. Yeah, my grandfather worked from from pictures as well. Um, and he was a photographer, um, and he was a veteran. He um, was a World War II veteran, and um, oh. he was a combat photographer in World War Two. Wow. He sailed on the um, the USS Nevada he, um, oh, okay. in the South Pacific. And uh, when he got back, he started a, a, you know, like a photography business. And then that sort of, um, you know, morphed into him teaching himself how to paint. And he would take landscape photographs and then he would paint them. He bought himself. Right. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful um, uh, paintings that he did. And when he knew he was dying, he died recently. He was 94 years old. Uh, but he had cancer, so we knew he was going to die. And he, um, you know, for the like the year up until he died, he was giving his paintings away. Like this one is for you. This one he had in mind where he wanted his paintings to go, and he got right. to give them to who he wanted them to go to. Well, that's good. Um, yeah. So that's how connected you know um, artists are with their with their pieces. It, it, it means something else to the person looking at it, but it means it has a whole different meaning sometimes for the artist. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I have to have that conversation usually once or twice at a show that uh, <laughs> that they say, "What well, what does this mean to you?" And then I tell them, and then they say, "Oh well, here's what here's what I'm saying." I'm like, well, yeah, that's fine. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. You're the viewer. You can you can. Uh, Put whatever meaning you have attached to it on that. That's that's why it's 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 art. It's not a telephone conversation. Right. <laughs> yep. And but I really liked how um, the painting that my grandfather gave to me. He had a story behind it. So. Right. Um, the painting was of Monument Valley, and um, while he was taking pictures of that particular spot that he did the painting of. Um, this Indian guy drove up in his truck. It was like the, in the seventies and he had, mm -hmm. he was like, Hey, how you doing? You know, you, you having fun? It's like, yeah. And then he was like, well, you know, they started talking. He's like, you want to see our, our reservation? You want to see what, what's, what it's all about? And he was like, yeah. So, um, he hopped in his truck and he had like a, one of those eight track tapes and he right. stuck it. He had a powwow, um, tape and he stuck it in oh. and they went riding around. He took them everywhere. Uh, on the reservation, met everybody. He was just thrilled oh, that's cool. with that day. Yeah, so um, I get that special story to remember too, as, as well as the painting <laughs> in my in my living room. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. So my that was my grandfather that was adopted. So, um, who we found out was Basque, but he was always told that his his mother was native, but he. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he didn't know if that was the case or not. But um, the last thing that he asked for was he wanted to hear a native language before he died. Um, and so he asked my dad to go rent Dances with Wolves so he could hear Lakota before he died. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's on my my dad's side. Oh, my mom's cool. side, there's the, the Choctaw. My mom's side is basically um, Appalachian hill people and Gulf region sharecroppers. It's I'm pretty much, you know, you know, just a simple country uh, hill person, I guess. <laughs> right. But I've been to London. I used to live there oh. for a little bit. Yeah, so I even modeled there, too. Went to college a little bit. Um, so I wow. modeled in... Philadelphia, Boston, London, San Francisco, and Oakland. All of those cities throughout. Good times. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, really good. I'm, 
it's good to travel when you're when you're young um, away from the the country that you're from mm -hmm. because, I agree yeah Did, have you gone out of the country um, yourself no not very much uh, I'm, you know I've been to Canada Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Ireland yeah uh, but mostly just just around the states I've done a lot of yeah. traveling in the states but no I would love to, to travel more but yeah. uh, just haven't been given that opportunity yet. Yet, yet. that's right. This um, this idea of getting your um, work into Europe, I think would it would be a real hit to do a native uh, art tour and just have like I don't know, maybe uh, five or six native artists like tour the UK. That'd be great. Europe. I would. Yeah, I, w I would definitely go for that. Yeah. Let's put that out there in the universe. That would be great. It's out there in the universe now. All it's right. Me, it's going to happen. <laughs> just, just remember that idea. Robert Martinez wants to go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not those other artists. They had Robert Martinez. <laughs> Don't right. forget. I've, I've always really wanted to go to Italy and Florence and see see the all the big names. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll see some Michelangelo, some Da Vinci, you know, take a look at, at the original stuff. Yeah. That, One of these days. I would love to see that, too. What about um, France, the Louvre? Do you ever want to go there? I would, but I hear that the Louvre is kind of just stock packed with people all the time, and it takes forever to get in, so mm -hmm. I'm not a big line guy. So the so thrill is gone. A little bit. Yeah. With the line, the thrill once is I, gone. Yeah, yeah. Once I heard that it took somebody like three hours to get in, somebody told me that one time, and I was oh like, you know goodness. what? I don't need to see it that bad. Yeah. Wow, wow. There's amazing art museums all over the all over the country that nobody even yeah, knows about. You, right, and you'll you'll run into them at the oddest places. A couple of years ago, I was in <clears throat> Vegas. Um, and I happened to be there with my wife, and I don't, I'm not a big gambler, so I wasn't gambling, we were just walking around the casino, but we kept seeing a sign saying a uh, European art uh, on display, so we went in there, um, and it was free to get in, it was in the casino, mm -hmm. um, but it was uh, a conglomerate of Van Gogh, Gauguin, I was shocked, Wow. I was shocked that, that they, and they were originals, Wow. and they were just there. They were just there on display. It was a traveling exhibit, and the casino happened to have them. And I was yes, flabbergasted. Another time, I, we we actually had a group show, Northern Rappo show, uh, down in a, a smaller city of uh, Rollins, Wyoming. And they have a great uh, community arts center there. And they're, they're run by two ladies that are just phenomenal at their job. And then they also have their own little collection of artwork. And right there, right in the middle of their collection, is an original Norman Rockwell. Wow. In a, in a little community of arts center in the middle of Wyoming, middle of southern Wyoming. I wouldn't have, you, you could have pushed me over with a feather. I was wow. shocked. Um, what do you think the, the internet has done to, um, say, for instance, um, like back when when I was a kid, these little artist communities would pop up in different areas, like, um, mm -hmm. but you don't really hear about them anymore now that people, wherever they're at, can get their stuff out there. Um, do you think that's it's had an effect or we're, we're just not hearing about it, these little communities? Or? Well, I think those probably are now more maybe have, have had the title changed as a retreat. They still have a couple in Wyoming. Mm. They call them a fellowship retreat, uh, you know, where you can go and, you know, you get your own little cabin and you paint and work and you're there for a little bit and there's other artists doing the same thing. Mm. Um, and, you know, you can get that kind of artistic group kind of a thing going on and some support for it and, and talk with other artists and stuff. But, I do think that the internet and social media has changed it, made it easier for artists like myself who live in the middle of um, 
you know, a, a, the least populated state in the union to get my work out there and seen by people all the way over, you know, like yourself in mm -hmm. Virginia and and all over the globe and and to be able to just message or talk to, I talk to people all the time that just don't want to know a little bit more about my art or about myself. It's a great way for, for art, artists to get their message or work across or images or just find out more about other people. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole, the, the, the memes, uh, various um, images that they seem to pop up um, at the same time in, mm -hmm. in, in people's art and it's like maybe a, a, a product of sort of like a collective unconscious or oh I saw this and it, it really uh, it made me think of this and so now I'm putting this in here but it seems that, like there's these memes or ideas they're really in the form of images but they, they pop up at the same time in a bunch of different it's, arts yeah it's possible like this, just this last year, I wasn't really aware that there are uh, a number of native, specific native artists doing uh, um, artwork that's related to uh, the Star Wars saga. Mm -hmm. Like right. I did one, and then there's um, Ryan Singer, who, who does great paintings. Um, Mavatsa Honyanki, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he's uh, Hopi. He does carvings. He does carvings of some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, April Holder. She's done some work like that. Yeah, I was kind of like, yeah, I didn't realize it was such a a genre within a genre. Yeah. Saw it. And Stephen Paul Judd uh, as well. Oh, I, yeah. How could I forget Stephen Paul Judd? I love yeah. his work. Oh, I do too. Monkey Echo Hawk. Yeah. Yep. And the Superman too. Like that seemed to pop up all you know. Like in a bunch of native yeah. artists at the same time, and even people's right, regalia, and you know, like it was just like boom, yeah. all at the same time. Yeah. I often wonder about that. Um, I did a whole series of, of native superheroes, and I wasn't even you know kind of tuned into that thing. I was just thinking that in Indian country we don't have a lot of heroes. We have movies, and we have you know our heroes tend to be sports stars or something like that, that mm -hmm. many of them aren't even native, so we don't have any native heroes. So I did a whole series of native superheroes, you know, starting with uh, Captain Native America, and then mm -hmm. I did Superman. Actually, I did two Superman. I did um, one that's a painting, and then one that was based off of Jim Thorpe. Nice. Who was a real native Superman. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, I just did a... Uh, uh, one based off of Batman. I did a Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. Even sounds like an Indian name, Dark Knight. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. And then I just I just recently did because uh, I had a lot, a lot of females, all you strong females out there. I had a lot of females asking me, "What are you going to do a Wonder Woman one?" So I yeah. just finished a Wonder Woman one. And if you catch me at any of the markets this summer, unless I I sell it right off the bat, you'll get to see it. Wonderful. I've been I've been holding off on posting it so that people can can see it in the flesh first. Ah, okay, well, great. I I can't wait till you post it. <laughs> That'll be nice. Um. Yeah. So, I guess um, it doesn't really matter what why these images, um, you know, pop up among. A bunch of people at the same time. It's just interesting to see. Um, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's kind of weird, like yeah, how what what I guess what's what's the best term? Synchronicity. Yeah, the best term, kind of kind of like that. Uh -huh. uh, last year, I, uh, I I've been doing a series of natives and, and people call them t-shirt paintings or whatever, but. It, have a native portrait and they'll have a t-shirt on saying something like mm -hmm. I did one with the Run DMC logo um I'm a big old school hip hop fan uh, and that painting was called Tougher Than Leather and then I did one with the ACDC I'm a big ACDC fan too mm -hmm. uh, that was called Thunderstruck and then kind of did some gangster rap and I did one with 
NWA, their their logo, and that one was called Natives with Attitude. And then it was just <laughs> right then when the, when the movie came out, and I didn't realize they were even doing a movie. Wow, yeah, see. But it was. I, I think it's got something to do thing. with that creative process where you, as an artist, you tap in to something. Um, possibly, possibly. Yeah, yeah, because I'm sure you've had that experience more than once. I mean, many times where you're like, wow, I didn't even know that. Or someone says, oh, did you see so-and-so's and that's why you did that one? Because you were, you know, it's like a nod to them and you're like, who, what? I, right. I didn't know that. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, I have a bunch of people ask me, so did you hear the film was coming out at the same time? I was like, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that until I was done with the painting. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting just to look at it. I guess we don't really need to know why. Just, um, that's what happens in the creative process. You know? Yeah. Um, so, we have about a half hour left. Is there, are there any shows you'd like, that are upcoming that you'd like to promote if maybe people are in the area? Um, Sure. Um, let's see. Here in the next couple of weeks, I'll be in Casper, Wyoming. If anybody out there is around the Casper area for uh, Nick Fest, it's at the uh, Nicolaisian Museum. That's on the 24th, 25th, and 26th. Then June. after that, yeah, a few. Uh-huh. Then after that, I'll have that uh, Native Voices show opening in Butte, Montana the 2nd of July okay. and then after the week after that I will be back in Butte for the uh, Native People's Market in Butte alright so a lot of people out there in the west if you're listening get to those shows check it out um, when you started did you sell your work at powwows or do you still sometimes uh, no and no I, I never did sell my stuff at powwows hmm. um, I was always usually busy taking pictures or, or just visiting or enjoying a powwow mm-hmm. um, most of my artwork is usually just one I want for clients and then up, up until probably about six years ago I really started to get into the native market like native art market. Mm-hmm. Um, I had done, of course, different shows and in, 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 uh, that that popped up at at art centers or or in galleries before that, but um, it wasn't until until fairly recently that I really started um, centering on the the native art market itself. You know, Santa Fe, the big one, huge. Um, and of course, just lately, yeah, huge. Yeah. I mean, um, the, yeah, that 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 one's to say huge is an understatement. That's yeah. a a big crossroads and a career maker. Sometimes a career breaker, right here. So. Yeah, and what's interesting is that it that place has always been a crossroads too. I mean, you know, even before contact with, um, you know. Um, yeah, Euro- Europeans. That was a huge crossroads between, you know, basically Central and South American natives and North American natives, um, right? All meeting up in that that area. Um, Historically, the Arapaho tribe was one of one of the nations that actually did commerce up up through. Um, up, up, up into Montana and down, down on that Santa Fe Trail down there, we were known to to trade and barter goods from different tribes and kind of make a, a commerce circuit while while hunting buffalo there. Mm. Have you, as an artist, have, do you feel like the obligation? So anybody who puts themselves out there in Native America um, eventually is is um coached or put in sort of a 
in the in a situation t to where they have to sort of claim politically where they stand about things, especially in terms of climate change and things like that. Have you? Do you think you've you've been um, influenced, or do you think it's important as part of your art to to make political stands? Um, um you know. I, I do express my political and ideological stances in my artwork. They're, they're usually pretty subtle. Mm -hmm. um, mostly it's just in conversations. I think, in my opinion, I think that, you know, just as a human being, you should be able, you know, to to express your opinion on any any given subject and mm -hmm. and kind of say, say how or why. Um, Currently, my particular thing is I see so many people wanting to go extreme left or extreme right or, or, or you know, it's almost, a, it, it's, it seems like it's, it's maybe better to be an extremist for one side or the other rather than saying, you know, what, I think, I think maybe it's not black and white. I think it's kind of gray. And people just go, well, you're just wishy-washy. You know? Well, no, I don't think so. I don't think either one of you are right. I think it's kind of in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you... Every, every, everybody becomes so polarized, you know, you forget that, that just because I don't hold the same opinion or I disagree with you doesn't mean we can't like each other and get along, and then people forget that. Yeah. Really, too. I think that's been lost, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I... I for myself, I've always been someone that kind of leans left. Um, sure. You know, um, but I have recently, I guess, maybe over the past five years, really noticed how there's just as many sort of, there's just as much manipulation and tricks going on on the left as there is on the right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've become more independent in my political sort of... Um, leanings I, I just sort of you know I, I, labels don't impress me so you know this person's the democratic or this person's the, I'm not interested in the label I actually want to listen to what they're saying and then I have doubts as to whether democracy really even works I mean especially now um, what a joke the whole thing really seems yeah, I've been saying that particular thing for, oh man, probably since I was old enough to vote. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the, the two-party system works well. I don't believe that the electoral college works well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may have for a long time, but I don't believe it does now. Um, and, you know, I think we, we should probably figure out a different option. Yeah. It's a rigged game, I think. Um, right, and if if the game is rigged, the only solution is not to play or to to fix the game. Right, that's right. And so, so people who who um, are aware of the fact that the the game is rigged really seem to um, kind of I'm not going to say argue, but maybe go back and forth about which is the best option. You know, yeah, not playing. Um, or trying to fix it because I think people have been trying to fix it for a long time, um, you know. But uh, who knows? I don't know. I, I go back and forth myself about whether um, voting actually matters or not. Well, you know, it seems like the the higher the office, the, it seems like the lower your vote matters. Mm -hmm. I think locally in your local community yeah your your vote can have a huge impact but yeah. once you start getting to a higher office it seems that you know the, the game seems more rigged and you might have less of an impact but i don't know maybe that's just me i have i'm native so i have an inherent distrust of the government for some reason yeah i don't know what that comes from <laughs> it's a mystery <laughs> yeah but you know what i think um with the the events of the past you know, 10 years, um, certainly 9-11, um, and the collapse of the economy, um, the fact that the, the jobs that we're now getting, are now getting put back in the economy are really all service jobs. Uh, the, the middle class is evaporating. 
um, you know, uh, there are no more men. Um, there's a wider gap between the haves and the have-nots. In a way, uh, I think a lot of people, non-natives, are waking up to this, um, you know, the, what oppression is really all about. <laughs> and when right. they say things like, we want our country back, it's like, well, back from what? Um, you know. Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it is due to, uh, you know, conglomerate corporations, huge huge companies um you know how if you're in you're, you're in the board of directors on on a, you know a huge oil company and your your salary is um million dollars a year i mean what do you what do you really do with that money i mean you can only be in one mansion at a time you can only be in one limo at a time you can only drive one ferrari at a time mm-hmm. you know do you really need 17 of them right i'm just saying how about how about let's give half of them back? Let's just say half. You know, you can stay a billionaire. Once you once you give a billion to 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 produce a maybe an extra factory over here that can employ some people or, or stuff like that. You know, I I realize that that uh, being a, a worker in India or China or someplace like that is cheaper for you, but is cheaper really the bottom line when you can impact you know. 60, 70 American families? I don't know. That's just kind of one of the things I always seem to think about. You know, it, 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 once you get past a certain amount of zeros in your, your bank balance, I mean, it, it, it kind of becomes just theoretical after that, really. Right. You have enough money to buy whatever you want. After that, it's just numbers on a computer screen. Well, in a way, it's all theoretical. All the numbers, you know. As far as the banking system goes, yeah, <laughs> it's like a lot of Very that true. money is is just it's just in a computer. It's not really there. Um, well, that's yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. if you're buying a meal, okay, you can understand that. If you if you buy a car, you have something. If you buy a house, you have something. But yeah, after you get past a certain point, it's just it's it's numbers. That's all it is. Numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the richer, in fact, the, the more money in fact, you have. I, yeah, I I say that to some of my potential clients out on the road. If I'm selling artwork, I always say, "Hey, use the credit card. It's not real money anyway." <laughs> They're like, "The hell it ain't." <laughs> <laughs> when they get the bill, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, but um. Yeah, the the more money you have, the less you have to actually pay for. So you you know you pay less taxes, um, mm-hmm. you get more things for free or cheaper. You know you're in these little clubs and things. And that that flabbergasts me. Um, I do a show in L.A. at the Autry Museum in November, um, and you you will see movie stars and stuff come through there, and it's great to see them because it's kind of cool. I'm a big movie buff, so. Any any famous person, I get I get freaked out and oh gee wow you know, but it's amazing <laughs> when I see a, a, somebody that ha- I know that they're famous and they've been in movies and stuff, so you know they got money, but the, and you know people will just give them stuff, yeah, for free, and I'm like, why are you giving us free? You know they got big money. <laughs> yeah, they should be opening that checkbook. Yeah, putting some zeros on there. You know what? my husband says about, because he used to live in Malibu, um, mm-hmm. he says about uh, celebrities is that they all have hang out with an Indian for a day on their bucket list. <laughs> oh, really? I yes. never thought about it possibly, yeah. It's true. So he, he has these great stories like about just sitting at the Starbucks or, you know, in, in, in um, Malibu and then um, for instance, Richard Gere will come up and be like, Hey, you know, just start a company. You mind if I sit down? So yeah, <laughs> spent, spent the day with Richard Gere so he could like knock that off his bucket list. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's right. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, so I like doing the Autry show because I get to see movie stars. It's just fun for me, you know. I just yeah, it's pretty cool. Movie so stars then, or rock stars, or so maybe that um, will help with your, um, you know, 
uh, celebrity sort of ooh wowness is like your ooh wow to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, very true. Yep. Well, you know, they say that the actors and, and rock stars have a really big need for attention, so maybe that's what they're yeah what they're doing, looking for looking for a little attention. External validation. Right? That's yeah, what it's yeah. all about is the external validation factor. A um, lot of funny stories there um, in that L.A. area. That's a whole sort of vortex of um, weirdness, that whole area. Um, yeah, that that's it's, it's crazy. I haven't spent too much time down there. I've been, like I said, to the Autry a few times and, and, and met some cool people and and stuff and checked out the what is it Santa Monica Pier and and you know the stars on the Hollywood Boulevard and Brahmin's training theater there and all the touristy stuff so when you say you're a movie buff like what what movies are would you rate as like your top movies that oh, you have to tough, see that's a tough question that's a tough question I bet. I've tried to do that I've tried to I've tried to make that list the list of the best movies ever. Oh, it's yeah. tough. It's tough for me. Um, although you know, I got the the original Star Wars movies there in the top there. The uh, uh, Indiana Jones movies. Um, Conan the Barbarian, the original with the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Let's see. Um. Mountain Men, if anybody ever saw that with uh, Charlton Heston and Brian Keith. Mm. Great movie. Great movie was filmed part of it in Jackson. I love that movie. Um, My dad goes there every uh, year to Jackson. Oh, does he? Yeah. Every year. Let's see, what what else? Uh, Little Big Man. Love that movie. If you're native, you kind of love Little Big Man, though. Yeah, you have to. It's just a uh, I love Josie Wells, but that's more just for Chief Dan George that's in there. Yeah. Uh oh, Billy Jack, that's got to be in there. Billy Jack's um, like made a resurgence in, in native thought uh, lately. It's just sort of a lot of people talking about him. Right. My mother had me watch Billy Jack probably. We got it on VHS and I was a young, young guy. And she told me, here's, here's a native hero. And of course, of course he's, he's half native. He's not. Right. But um, I thought he was pretty cool, you know, because I'd never seen an uh, Indian guy fight for the right of, well, you know, the the hippie school there. <laughs> yep. Kick ass on on film. Right, and I remember going back to tell my friends about Billy Jack, and they looked at me like I was stupid, like who? Billy who? What? <laughs> an Indian guy? I've never seen that. You know, of course, the, it was. 15 years old by that time, but, um, mm. <laughs> yeah, that list of going the Godfather trilogy, uh, just, I, I, movies, movies, movies. What about, uh, the cable series and things like that? Did you get into the Sopranos? Um, you know, I was into the Sopranos. Um, I, I'm a voracious reader too, so, I'm kind of I'm I'm not hooked on the Game of Thrones series, but I'm wondering where it's going because it's out outrun the books now. I've read, read all the books. Mm. Um, I was the Breaking Bad fan. That was a good series, I thought. I I live under a rock, so I've never seen Breaking Bad. Oh. I've never seen Game of Thrones. I don't even have a TV, so I watch Netflix uh, though. I have that. Anyway. Yeah, I live. You can catch um, Breaking Bad on Netflix. Uh, when I have to be in the mood, um, <laughs> um, but I live out in the we, woods. Yeah. So it's just too expensive right. to get satellite cable and all that. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, we have we have a, we have a satellite. I live about ten miles outside of the nearest town and in the country, so we we have to do that. Rural America gets we, screwed when it comes to internet <laughs> capability because right. you know when when people talk about the digital divide they they think you know because 
um, their cable internet sucks. You know, it's like you don't know sucks until you've right. lived in the country where you have satellite with data usage limits and it goes out when it starts raining and just it's awful, terrible. Yeah, cell service at my house is in and out. That's why I'm mm -hmm. currently talking to you at the nearest town where I know cell service is, is, uh, is not going to drop to Paul. Right, and that's why I'm in the nearest town as well, in my truck, talking <laughs> to you. <laughs> ah. <laughs> on my laptop, because we both live on the other side of the digital divide, so we have to ah, work with yeah. it, right? Got to work with it. Right. And so, and I think that it's, I've, I've actually connected it to um, Agenda 21, believe it or not. They want everybody to get out of rural America and move into cities and towns where they're more um, controllable. Uh, they don't want, you know, wild free spirits out there in the woods learning how to grow their own food and eat weeds and um, hunt for their own food and stuff like that. They want people to have a controlled, um, and, and they sell it as, as sustainability, which it's not. Um, so that's why rural America will continually get screwed when it comes to the government talking to them about what's legal and not legal in terms of what you can provide as so-called service for internet connect, connected, connectivity. Um, so one of the things Obama promised was that he was going to get rural America connected. Thanks, Obama. It's working out really, really good. <laughs> And I actually work with one of those, uh, he, like there was these government worker people that were supposed to help you get connected and they, and they were just like, well, I don't know, maybe you could call this person. They, they didn't do anything at all. It was just a big waste of money and time. So, because companies aren't going to invest in infrastructure that they need to build for the yeah. three people that are going to hook onto it if they build it, you know, it's, it's not yeah, worth it, worth it to them. And, and if there's these other uh, shady companies like HughesNet, for instance, um, that can make <laughs> a mint off of people that live in the country, they have a deal set up with the government to where they can fleece rural America. Um, that's the deal. And it's totally legal because they write their own bills, corporations. Um, so that's how they can set this thing up. And that's why we yeah, have to work around it. Corporate America. Corporate America, I don't know about. Yeah. It's uh, becoming increasingly in indistinguishable from the government. It's like one big entity. Corporate government. I think it has been, yeah. I think it has been for quite a while. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I think about younger people and how that's always the way it's been for that's that's the normal so it's like well what do you mean you know corporations and corporatism and that's just reality you know yeah um or our rights you know our basic rights uh post 9 11 what do you mean like you didn't have to take your shoes off to fly a plane when you were a kid you know or even into your most of your adult life you know what do you mean one person failed at a shoe bomb and now we all have to take our shoes off mm -hmm. it, you know uh, it doesn't make sense it's like theater um, and and the amount of money it's just amazing that went into well, it you, right you know and I kept waiting for the that that, that movie security um, futuristic movie security kind of technology to catch up it's got to be available mm-hmm you know, where you, instead of having to take your shoes off and everything, you just walk through a thing and it's no big deal. I mean, they they do have it already, but I don't see why it's, uh, I get flagged every time on the fly. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yeah, you expect it. Yeah, yeah, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll step in the circles. Go ahead. Go ahead, pat me down. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you learn, you just learn to live with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when when uh, when we go to a powwow, I drive so we don't get pulled over. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
just yeah, I get I get pulled it. over too. I get pulled over all the time. Yeah. Mostly it's because I'm looking around and I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, and I'll pray to have a minor minor traffic ordeal, like because I'm trying to find an art art venue and I'm in a, in a place that I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Sir, can we help you find something? Yeah, I was trying to find that place right there across the street. I missed it. Oops. Oh, that's why you were slowing down. Yeah, that's why I was slowing down. <laughs> Are you one of the ones that turns down the radio so you can see? Yeah. Where the... Yeah. <laughs> I am too. I don't know what it is. It's like there's too many distractions. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. That's what it is. And I, and I, well, I, and I used to, I went to college in, in Denver and I go through there periodically, but every time I go through Denver on the... On our highway interstate through there, I always turn down the radio. Just, I don't need that kind of distraction on this on this interstate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like a four ninety five around DC. People pass you on. You know, I drive pretty pretty fast, but people pass you like on the left and the right, and it's just mm -hmm. totally insane. And um, yeah, um, crazy people driving in DC. Let's see. Uh... I still think, and I and I've I've driven in in L.A. too, L.A. traffic. I think Denver traffic is worse than L.A. traffic. I've never, I've never driven back east. I've been back there, and somebody else is driving. But I've never driven back east. But I'm I'm pretty sure so far Denver has has everybody beat. Wow! Just the way that people drive, just crazy, or just plugged up I, well I don't think they know how to drive very well yeah <laughs> yep. LA is a close second from what I know but I haven't driven around too much in DC LA. ranks up there it ranks up there pretty high like in the first five I think of crazy horrible traffic you know, that's why people I live a hundred miles away that's why people live here and commute all the way to DC Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want that to me. Me neither. It'd be terrible. It would drive me crazy. Literally. Crazy. Just insane. And the whole well, We have that far of a we have that far of a community here, but it's it's quite a bit different uh, traffic. Mm hmm <laughs> Yeah. For me I, I it's like a fifteen mile drive but it's all country roads and sometimes I get behind a you know, somebody like driving mm -hmm. a tractor or you know, got to swerve to miss right. a couple turtles, you know, in the road, that kind of thing. But it's, it's beautiful. Mostly around here, it's just weather, whether the roads are, are good or not. Traffic's usually only a minor inconvenience. Unless it's road construction season, which it is now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. We see our infrastructure. Um has needs a lot of work it hasn't been worked on for a long time you know i um that that's probably one of the biggest things i could criticize the current administration for is they said they were going to fix all the infrastructure and it didn't happen mm -hmm. that was a huge thing too it's like oh this is going to be like the new deal for our time you yeah know, everybody yeah. was yeah, excited and nothing a lot of nothing. Yeah, didn't happen. Didn't happen. Maybe they tried. Well, was, yeah. Because Congress wouldn't let anything pass through. They just, they just sh don't do anything. Bill, no, no, oh, no, oh, is it a bill that restricts women's reproductive rights? Let's pass that. That's what's that. What, that's what we really need to get on right now. That's what right. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. Yeah. Drives me nuts. Just it really does. And I. Oh my goodness. See how fast I told you you wouldn't believe how fast this goes. Oh, it now yeah, that did go like right that. <laughs> thank you, Robert Martinez, for taking the time out to talk to me today, and thank you, listeners, for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Until next time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.